great. Thanks, everyone. I hope you're having a, <clears throat> a rewarding time here at the event. I, I certainly am. Uh, my name is Bruce Momgen. I am <clears throat> sorry. One of the core team members, uh, but also an EDB employee for 15 years. And um, I'm here to talk to you about flexible indexing. Uh, again, I hope you're having a great time. It's, you know, I was just philosophically thinking it's, it's sort of like the fact that you actually came and sort of took the risk of coming. It's, it's like coming to a conference is now sort of climbing Mount Everest, even though all you did was show up at an event, right? Um, but obviously, you know, everyone's sort of, uh, yeah, you sometimes get pushed back from your family or pushed back from people who think, you know, well, you really need to go, but you really sometimes you need to go. And um, I think it's worth the time and worth, um, you know, worth the experience because hopefully you're getting a chance to talk to a lot of people. I've talked to a number of you already. Um, <clears throat> this talk is actually one of 57 talks that I've written. Uh, if you take a look, and I think my pointer will work here, uh, right here um, on my website, there are... Uh, 57, including this presentation. Uh, there are 90-some videos of those presentations and over 600 blog entries. So uh, if you're so inclined to follow up, uh, that would be the best way to do that. Uh, I would love if I was able to give you some of the precursor presentations that sometimes are given with this one. Um, the first one, which is, again, all on my website, is called uh, Postgres at the Center of Your Data Center. It talks about the extensibility of Postgres. It talks about how Postgres is work, going into new workloads, how it does data analytics, uh, and how it does foreign data wrappers. So a whole sort of host of things in terms of extendability. Second talk is non-relational Postgres, which goes through eight data types, uh, which Postgres supports, which are not relational. Uh, data types like JSON, range types, GIS, uh, full text search, okay? Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning those other talks is because you have to have a context to understand why this talk is important. Um, we've all been, maybe many of us have been in the database industry for years. I certainly have. And in the, you know, back in the old days, uh, we only had B-Tree. Uh, and if we were lucky, maybe we had a hash index. But as you may know, uh, the number of data types and the number, the amount of data, the type of data that databases need to store today is much different than it was decades ago. Uh, I, have a, I have a talk about data horizons in Postgres, which talks about a lot of the new data, data entry, data ingestion, data requirements for new databases, things like Internet of Things, web apps, um, you know, mobile apps, uh, GIS data, uh, documents, um, social media. Right, all new requirements for databases, and databases you can't adapt to those. New requirements effectively are not really meeting the needs, and that's why I think you see a lot of the rise of these secondary uh, new databases that are kind of coming around uh, to meet specialized data needs. Now, fortunately, Postgres was designed to be extendable, and one of those extendable areas, as well as data types, is indexing. And you might say, well, why do I need more than B-Tree? Why do I need more than hash? Well, the bottom line is that you cannot use many of these non-traditional, non-relational data types unless you also have specialized indexing methods to support them. I don't know how many of you have had the experience of trying to shoehorn an application that, that really shouldn't be using B-Tree into using B-Tree. Uh, I've had that experience very unfortunately. Um, where you're just, it doesn't, B-Tree isn't really working for this data type, but that's all you have, and you just kind of, kind of whack it around. Maybe you have a nightly build that kind of, kind of scrunches it into some format that works. But in many cases, those B-Tree hash indexes are very linear, okay? They're, they're, they're expecting a linear set of values, and anything that doesn't fit that linearity can be a problem. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, are unfortunately not the non-relational data types, because again, that's one of the presentations on my site, but how do we index those non-relational data types? And I'll be referencing them as I go, and again, if you have any questions, we'll, I'll be glad to, to answer those. Um, I'll stop really pretty much during the talk, take questions, and then continue, okay? So, what are we gonna talk about? First, we're gonna talk about traditional indexing. That's the sort of B-tree hash that we're all familiar with, and we'll look at some of the limitations that those traditional uh, indexing types have, okay? 
Then we're going to talk about some of the non-traditional indexing methods, still built upon B-Tree, but they're, they allow you to be a little more flexible with the type of indexing you should do. And I think it's important that you, that you know that. Um, and then we're going to basically launch into some of the non-B-Tree indexing types, which I think is going to be really interesting. Um, and I'll give you specific examples of that. So, any questions before I start? Great. Okay, let's go. All right. Traditional indexing. Uh, B-Tree. This is the one everyone's familiar with. Uh, research goes back to the 60s, I believe, or even the 50s to sort of, sort of have an indexing type that, that it becomes sort of a binary tree that you can find values really easily. Um, but B-Tree is only good for certain use cases. Particularly, it's very good for looking up unique values. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you have a lot of duplicates, okay, B-Tree may not be the perfect index for you. It still may work, but it may not be the ideal index, and I'll explain why as I go forward, okay? Um, and it also obviously is good for you maintaining uniqueness. If you've got a unique requirement on a column, B-Tree is the natural place to, for that to happen. It's very, it has a very high concurrency, so there's been a lot of research done, and, and Postgres has continued to improve the concurrency of the indexing so that um, you can effectively have multiple people adding, removing things to the B-Tree index all at the same time without having them interfering with each other in, in most cases. Uh, it's basically set up as a key row pointer kind of an index, and you, I'll show you later what some other options are. But effectively, you typically have a key, the, the, the value you're indexing, 5, 7, 12, and then you've got a, a row pointer, which points to the actual data row that contains that, that particular value. Okay. Um, B-Tree is also very good for certain types of queries. So, for example, if you have an order by um, uh, or a limit clause, then those are very useful for um, for using B-Tree. Uh, things like merge joins, if you're not familiar with those, I do have a, a talk called Explaining the Postgres Query Optimizer, which does talk about merge joins, if you're curious about that. Uh, in addition, nested loop with index scans, another uh, topic covered in my talks, uh, which is very good with B-Tree. Okay? Uh, but you may want more. That might not be enough for you. Uh, so you may want to index expressions or functions. We'll show you how to do that. You might want better row control. You might want a smaller or lighter weight indexes. I'll show you those. You may want to index nonlinear data. What is nonlinear data? I'll show you what that is. You might want to do closest match searches, like what is the closest point to some other point. Um, you may want to index things with many duplicates. As I said, B-Tree's not great for that. Um, and you, wanna, you may want to index multi-valued fields. Uh, this is a case where you have multiple values inside a single column. Think JSON, think full text search. You really have multiple words in a full text search document. You have multiple keys and values inside a JSON field. How would B-Tree work with that? Mm, not great. There are better options and Postgres does support them. Uh, I mean, I'll frankly tell you that this extendable capability of Postgres and its ability not only to handle non-relational data, but to handle non-relational data efficiently is one of the reasons that Postgres is so popular today. Um, it, if it was just like traditional databases, it wouldn't be as exciting as it is. So let's talk, with, let's talk about a simple case. Um, this is still using B-Tree, uh, but it's a case where you want to index an expression. So why would you want to index? Actually, let me ask. Do you have any questions? Okay. Uh, why would you want to index an expression? Well, um, traditionally, you index columns. And you say column equals three. You index column X, you know, and you say X equals three. And the system knows, oh, that's, that's X. I have an index for it. I'm going to look up all the threes that are in that column. Okay. But there are cases where you may want to modify the column and index the output of that modification. Uh, so, for example, let's suppose we don't want to look up Andy in lowercase, we want to look it up in upper or lowercase. So our query is where lower of, of name equals Andy. So it would be uppercase Andy, lowercase Andy, mixed case Andy, they all should match. Um, 
The problem is if you create an index like the second row here, the bottom query will not be able to use, to, to, the first query will not be able to use the second, that first index there. Because you, you index the column name, but we're not comparing the column name, we're comparing lower of the column name. What's great about the bottom example is that you can actually index the output of the function on the column. And then anywhere you use that function on that column, the index will be used. And you're not going to use this on day one, but again, as I said before, instead of trying to shoehorn something in, this gets you out of a lot of problems. Okay, so let's look at an example. Customer table, we're going to put a thousand entries in here. Uh, we're going to create a customer, an index on the name column, the first red query here. Um, and then we're going to say, okay, customer equals 999. Works great, okay? But then the bottom query, as soon as we add the lower in there, yes, sir? If I do that and uh, put the lower name into a view as like lower name, will and, and I use a where clause on lower name, will it be able to see through the, 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 the view and still use the functional index? Yeah, so I, I guess I don't need to repeat it because everyone heard it. So um, in fact, yes, it, it, the way the optimizer works, the way the whole query processor works is that effectively we parse the, the input, we tokenize it, we identify the type of statement it is, a select and update, we load a structure, and then we run it through what we call the rewriter, where we handle views and rules. So all the replacement happens at that stage. So whatever view you referenced would automatically be replaced by whatever the view definition was, and that output then goes to the optimizer. So the optimizer really doesn't see your view, it really sees the, the combined output of the actual columns and functions that you call. And therefore, the optimizer would, I, it would, it would be identical as you typing it out manually um, and expanding the view yourself. Yeah, great question, yeah. So if you, yeah, again, if you had a view, you, had, you would still have to create the expression index, but it would know automatically. So you wouldn't have to use the lower in your query as long as the view had it, basically. Um, and thank you for getting him the microphone because I usually have to repeat the questions. Um, so you can see at the bottom here that lower doesn't use it. Um, but if I create this expression index right here at the top, then when I run that query again, you can see that, an expression, that, that special index is used. So again, you, you may not want to use it right away, but there's a bunch of cases where you kind of get stuck in this thing, whether it's certain string manipulation or concatenation or some kind of calculation where you want... You, you, you're doing that kind of comparison in your queries a lot, um, and the column value itself is not what you want. It's really the output of some manipulation of that column value. That's where this comes in. Um, you can call user-defined functions with the expression indexes. You can concatenate columns. You can do math expressions on them. The only requirement is the function has to be immutable. So if you look at the function definition, you can see which ones can be used in expression indexes and which, which ones can't. Um, but also, obviously, the where clause has to match the query, the, 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 the expression you used in the, in, the, in the index creation. If it doesn't match, the, this is the optimizer can't figure that out. Okay. Another, oh, any questions? Okay. So the next thing, and again, we're, gonna, we're starting really slow, but by the time at the end, you'll be like, wow, this is really weird. Okay, so don't worry. Um, partial indexes, now these are cases where you're only indexing part of a table. Okay? So just as expression indexes, we're, exp we're not indexing a column, but the output of some column function combination, row, uh, partial indexes are only indexing certain rows in the table. So um, why would you want to do this? Well, let's suppose you're writing a query um, and you're only really going to want to look up certain rows. So for example, let's suppose you have a, an accounting application and you have a Boolean flag which indicates whether the order is zero balance or not. Right? So you could create an index and say, give index all of the rows that have a non-zero balance. 
<clears throat> and I don't know if you've used a lot of accounting apps, but like 99% of the orders have zero balances, right? Um, and instead of, instead of indexing the balance of all the rows, and again, you probably don't care about the zero balance rows, you can effectively create an index just on the non-zero rows. And then if you want to look up the non-zero rows, typically to run reports, that's how you create a partial index to do that. Uh, these partial indexes are obviously smaller because they're only indexing certain rows in the table. They take up less memory. There's less deep, right? So when you're, when you're walking through the index, it's not as deep. Um, there's less insert and update overhead. So again, if, um, if every time you index a row, if somebody changes it, you typically have to update the indexes. If you're not indexing those rows, it, it isn't an issue. Uh, but you can still access the whole table. You can still sequential scan. So if you want rows that don't match the partial, this system will still work. It'll just won't use the index. So again, the index isn't restricting us from getting the data. It's merely making a faster way we can get to certain rows and saying, if you want the other rows, we're not going to use the index for that. Okay. Um, here's an example. I'm going to create um, a table called customer. I'm going to add a column to the customer table. And I'm going to assign a whole bunch of people to Arizona, okay? And then I'm going to create an index for all the people in Arizona. Now, maybe I have a, a tax requirement for Arizona. Maybe my business is in Arizona. I don't know why. But let's suppose I'm more, I'm usually interested in people from Arizona. So I create an index here. And to create the partial index, what I do is I add a where clause on the end of the index creation. It's kind of unusual, but it works. Because then when I say, go give me everyone from Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from, it uses a sequential scan because we don't have an index on the Pennsylvania rows. But if I want to do an index on the Arizona people, you can see it immediately uses the special um, partial index that I created for Arizona. Now, you can even make it more sophisticated. Here I'm actually indexing the name. See, because take a look back here. I'm, I'm indexing the state, but I'm saying where everyone's in Arizona, right? So that index effectively has identical indexed values. They're all AZ, right? Because, because the where clause equals of AZ, and I'm indexing the column that I just said. So that's kind of silly. There's not a lot of use to that. So I can create a different index, like this one, where I say, for all the people in Arizona, index their name. Because I already know they're in Arizona because the, the index tells me that, particularly if you're doing an equality index like this. You just say, all right, name, just do the name. And now I can say, OK, if I want everyone in Arizona, it uses the index. Um, if I want, so this is, so here I'm actually at the top one, I'm saying, give me the name customer 975 and Arizona, and it knows to do that, and it's obviously going to come very quickly, because not only am I looking only at people in Arizona, but I can use the B-Tree index to find that particular name in the index, right? So I'm getting a double win here, right? A, I'm only, that, I know the index only contains people from Arizona, and inside that index, I have all the names. So that's very, very, that's a much faster way of doing it. And, uh, I'm sorry? Yes. So the question is, um, if if I create a, an index where the one's Arizona and the one is, um, and I index the customer like this one, does it does the index contain both columns? And the answer is no. Okay, because the the where clause is attached to the index. It's like an expression that's attached to the index. So I could have said we're state in equal Arizona or state equals Pennsylvania, okay? And that expression is in my index, and therefore, when I look to consider that index, I run, I compare the where clause nodes to the expression I've attached to the index, and if it passes, if it matches, then I can go and look at the index values. Okay, so that's a great question, and somebody nobody asked before. Um, but in fact, that expression is not, it's not like I take the AZ and stick it in there, because that would be just kind of weird. Um, particularly considering I can put, ex I, can do an ex I can do a function call here, 
I can do, I can do an or clause, like I can have a whole bunch of stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> so effectively, if I had like state Arizona or state Pennsylvania or state New Jersey, I might want to put the state in this index because all of a sudden this index isn't telling me the state anymore, the contents, and now I'm really got to pick through the state and maybe the name depending on what my requirements are. Yeah, great question, okay? Uh, any other questions? Okay, the point here is that it works with the top one where I'm doing the customer name and the state, and it works just for the state, either one, they both work. Okay, so let's, let's, move, let's move kind of out of this and talk about, yes sir? Um, so if I had, with your OR clause, if I had uh, an index, if you did uh, where state equals AZ or state equals PA, um, would, if I had separate partial indexes on state equals AZ and state equals PA, would I use both partial indexes? Can the planner do that? So that's a great question. So if you had an OR clause, so when you start to look at an OR clause in, in Postgres, <clears throat> whether you're using partial indexes or not, Okay, um, and again, this is more about my explaining the query optimizer that I haven't, we're not presenting, but um, what you, when, when you have two clauses which both could potentially use an index, you start to look at maybe using a bitmap scan, okay? And you can see the bitmap scan right here at the bottom, okay? And in the bitmap scan, what we typically do, there's a couple reasons we use a bitmap scan. In this particular case, we're using a bitmap scan because we expect a lot of duplicates, right? Because we expect, notice the, the top query does not use a bitmap scan because it knows there's probably one customer with that name based on the query statistics, okay? And therefore, it's just gonna do an index scan. But if it expects a lot of duplicates, it will use a bitmap index scan. The second reason we would use a bitmap index scan is we, if we want to take two indexes and merge them together. So what would happen in your particular case, hopefully if the tables are sufficient size, is we would create a bitmap for the first query using the first partial index, and then we would find the matches from the second partial indexes and find which ones we would merge those together with an or because you used an or, and then we would, then we would look up the rows. The other issue with this partial index is that you still validate the rows themselves. So even though the, the, the index is telling you how to get to something, we're still going to verify that because some of these cases, um, for example, if I had state Arizona and state something else, like how would that work if I only did Arizona, right? So it gets a little tricky, yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay. Let's take a look at bitmap index scans, and this is exactly what um, we talked about 30 seconds ago, right? Uh, a bitmap index scan happens when you have an index that might generate multiple hits on the same page, right? So you've got, you've got some duplicates there, and instead of revisiting the page multiple times, you create a bitmap and you hit each page in the bitmap in sequential order instead of sort of bouncing to page five and then 12 and then back to five, then 13 and then back to five. Um, it's, it can be allow you to use multiple indexes for the same query. It creates a bitmap of matching entries in memory. Um, it has either row or block level granularity. Um, and again, it's used for and or type queries, exactly what I just talked about. Uh, and it's part of the optimizer. And this is an example of exactly what we talked about. The first index on the left, the second index on the left. In this case, it's an and, so we're at, we're anding them together. Okay, but it could also be or together because it's a bitmap, right? And then we take the combined bitmap and we visit the pages. Okay, questions? You, you obviously set me up for that section, so thank you. Yes, sir. So when choosing between um, doing individual, when choosing between doing multiple indexes on columns, like like a B tree on column A and column B, versus relying on the bitmap between two indexes, how how would you choose between? Yeah, that's a great question. It's not something I technically would talk about in this presentation. The explain the optimizer is a better one for that. Um, but the short answer is that if you're doing column ABC, for example, if you're normally accessing just column B, odds are you're not going to be using that index because the A is not, is, is not selective enough. We do have some skip scanning. So if you were doing A and C and B was in the middle, 
We can do skip scan where we'll do all the A matches and then we'll skip over the Bs and find all the Cs that kind of match in there. Um, so it really depends on what your usage pattern is. If you're always going to be doing A and then optionally B or optionally C, ABC is probably a better example. If you're basically telling me I could do A or B or C with equal granularity, you're probably better with a separate indexes and then use, use the, allow the bitmap scans to happen. Yeah, great question. All right, so now we're going to get into the meat of this, the, you know, sort of the setup. Again, I'm excited that you're excited about what they can do. A lot of databases can't do these kind of things. Um, and again, you're not going to use these on day one, right? You don't go hog wild, but there's a whole bunch of cases where you get unusual data models, data patterns, and if you don't have these tools, you can't really solve a lot of pro some problems. And by having these tools, it allows you to kind of zero in and find the, and, and basically granularly create indexes which meet your particular needs, I think, in a very powerful way. But in an even more powerful way, we have a lot of non b tree data types, which I think address a lot of the, of the non-relational needs that are very common today. The first one, which you probably have heard of before, is called BRIN, or Block Range Indexes, okay? Uh, this was designed about mm, six years ago. Um, Alvaro Herrera um, out of Chile was the, the sort of the big driver behind this. Uh, and it's pretty interesting. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with, with uh, maybe bitmap indexes that uh, are stored on disk. Uh, Postgres does not support those for reasons I can get into. Um, but I think this BRIN index is very, very powerful. Uh, because, as you may know, indexes are fairly heavy. Uh, you may be familiar with cases of data warehouse where you just want to index every column. So indexing a B tree on every column is probably a bad idea. <laughs> the size of those indexes can be very large. The overhead of inserting, update, and delete can be very large. Uh, and you can really grind your database to a halt. So, um, the print indexes are tiny. Um, they're basically tiny indexes designed for very large tables. Uh, they basically store the minimum maximum value of a range of blocks in the table. Now, one advantage that came in Postgres 14 is you can actually have multiple min max block ranges for, um, in multiple min max groups for a range of pages in Postgres 14. It's called multi, multi range indexes. Um, and, and Magnus did cover that yesterday if you saw his talk. Uh, but typically the default is one min and max for one megabyte of data. So you have one megabyte if it's a, if it's a 500 gigabyte table then effectively you have 500,000 min-maxes. Those min-maxes are very small, uh, and it will basically tell you for a particular value, is the value you're looking for within the min-max range for that megabyte? If it is, we'll look through the whole megabyte. If it's not, we'll go to the next megabyte. Okay? This is particularly useful for data that is kind of temporal or have some sort of locality to it so that similar dates or similar values group together uh, physically in, in the storage. Um, again, allows you to skip through a lot of data that cannot possibly match your min-max. Uh, the, the value you're looking at is just not in the min-max, so I can just keep going. Um, again, very good for naturally ordered tables, chronological and circle only. Um, index is like tiny, I want to think, like for a huge table, it may be, you know, 500 kilobytes or something like that. Uh, just really small. Yes, sir. Uh, can, so it stores the min max. Can you use it for min max? If you do like a, can you like sort of sequentially look through the brin pages and, may, and like once we find a max and say like, hey, okay, well, it's larger than anything that, that falls below it, so. I can stop looking or it can't do that? So the question is, can, oh, I'm sorry, the, he had the microphone. Um, so you cannot, the, the min max is not deterministic. So <clears throat> effectively you may have added a very high value into a block and then that value got deleted. And the min max will not come down from that. So you can't really do a min max aggregate 
by finding the mins of all the blocks and then saying that's your min. It might have been your min at some point in time, uh, but it's not your min today, uh, potentially. Um, so again, it's more of a, I want to think of it as more of a filter index. Uh, it, 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 it's always accurate in terms of the all values are within that range, but it, the, the endpoints are not always accurate. Yeah. Um, they're very inexpensive to, un to update because they're very small. Most, most inserts update to lease will not affect the min-max at all. Um, and again, it's possible to index every column at, at low cost, which is just, B-Tree is just terrible for that. Um, second data, second index type. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see a hand. They do seem to be very useful uh, and inexpensive. Uh, any downsides to just having them as default on, it almost seems like, you know, something that a column store database would do, right? I mean. Oh, so the idea would be that you would basically create a Brint index for every column for every table. By default. By default. No one has ever asked that before. Um, I, you know, that's it's a creative idea. I, I've never thought of it, but yeah, you could, you could potentially do that. Yeah, they are that light that you could, particularly if you knew you were a data warehouse and you knew that, you know, all these things were happening. I don't know how people are doing it now. Maybe they're writing scripts which, which ought to do that, but I've never seen it automatically done, but I can see why you'd want to. I mean, one thing is, as you said, right, for large data warehouses, you could, you could just randomly once in a while be searching on a column that's never indexed exactly. at all. Exactly, yeah, exactly. This gentleman wanted to say something, yeah. Yeah, just a quick comment about that. that that's the way Natiza used to work with its zone maps of having a min-max, and it always had those, so, and that always was one of the fast those. ways okay. that it accelerated. Yeah, I think the issue is that Postgres is not always a data warehouse, right? It's, it's kind of a combo, um, but it would be kind of cool to have like a mode where you turn it on, and every time you create a table or add a column, it just automatically created something like that. Yeah, I can see, or even a tool that would go out and find out which ones aren't done, right? Like it run every night and tell me, you know, what, what isn't done. Because you're right, it's kind of, you're creating five columns in a table. It's kind of annoying to create, like, do cre five create indexes after that and make sure you get them all. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Very good point. That's, I never thought of that before. Uh, anything else? Okay. So the second, the second index type, which I think is really useful, is called GIN. Uh, it stands for Generalized Inverted Index. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense and doesn't, well, how do I explain it? It doesn't, uh, it isn't very descriptive to me. <laughs> um, but effectively, it's very good for matching places that have many duplicates. So things like text documents, and I'll show you some examples in a minute. Uh, JSON, multi, uh, multi-dimensional data like arrays, we have a lot of duplicates. Um, this allows you to store the data, the value once, and then the, the multiple rows get added to it. So remember when I said B tree was key value, key value, key value, this is basically key and then value, 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 right? Um, so um, ideal for columns became many duplicates, optimized for multi-row matches. Uh, so think, you know, think uh, B, B, bitmap indexes. Um, key is stored once and then you have many row pointers after that. Um, it does have a special batching mode because updates can be expensive, so it has like a holding area. It still works, you don't notice it, but there is this holding area that when you do inserts and updates, it kind of goes into the holding area, and then that's flushed every so often into the main index. So um, there's this internal ability, I don't remember what we call the holding area, but th that's what it effectively is. Um, uh, it allows compression of the row pointers, so again, you get a very tight index, um, and again, optimized for multi-key filtering. A uh, third one, which is, as the name says, generalized, is called generalized search tree or gist. Uh, these are effectively a framework of an index, not actually an index structure predefined like the previous ones, like B tree is B tree, right? Gin is gin, Brin is Brin. A gist index is effectively a container of some type of index and you can put a whole bunch of different types of indexes inside of there. Uh, very useful for geometric types, range types, hstore, which is key value, integer arrays, trigrams, and you, you see a lot of examples of those, and I'll, I'll show you a couple as we go. It also supports distance queries, so if you wanna find out what point is near another point, 
that also happens in the GIST indexes. Uh, there's a special type of index, and this is hard to get, to get your head around, called space partition GIST. Uh, and I'll have an example later. Um, but it basically allows the keys to be decomposed. Normally when you index a key, it's like a string, right? You just index the string. What, what space partition GIST does, it allows you to break the string up into pieces and index pieces of the string or pieces of the value in a B-tree-like way. I know, it's crazy. Um, it, it, it's, think of it as like a hierarchical way of breaking up a key. That's how I think of it. Uh, partition in different sizes, I'll show you some examples. Hash indexes, if you're familiar with these, we do have them. They don't have a lot of value over B-tree, frankly, in Postgres. Um, perfect for equality matches and non-equality, but obviously can't do greater or less than because of the hash. Um, no range lookups, uh, and it's crash safe in replication since Postgres 10. Those, this was not true years ago, and that's why I have this slide about it. Okay. So I'm not making this up. Uh, as, I po as I mentioned, Postgres is extendable, and therefore all of the index types are defined in the system tables. If you run that query at the top, you will basically get the list I just gave you, uh, which is basically Brin all the way down to SPGIST. Um, so index types, including B-tree, are objects that are defined in Postgres, and this is why we're able to add new indexing types so easily compared to other relational systems. Index summary, B-tree is ideal for unique, Brin ideally for many columns, GIN for duplicates, SPGIST for duplicates in prefixes, and um, GIST for everything else. Okay, so that's how I kind of think of it. This is hard to remember sometimes, that's why I kind of, this, this is like the cheat sheet. And again, these slides are online, so uh, if you forget, uh, just go back there. All right, let's get into some of the details of exactly what it looks like for specific use cases. So if I take a look and I query the system tables, I say, give me all the data types that support B-tree. I get a pretty big list, okay? But keep in mind, this list may not be the best for B-tree. It just means B-tree supports it. But we may have a better index type for this particular type uh, column. What supports Brin, okay? Not every data type supports Brin. The gentleman was asking about indexing every data type. Some data types can't be indexed with Brin. So just be aware of that, right? Um, a lot of, a lot can, but again, you, they're mostly linear data types. Uh, GIN, much smaller, much, much smaller list of things that support GIN. Because mo most indexes, most data types don't have a lot of duplicates. The ones that do, array, JSON, text search. Those are the three, have a lot of duplicates, and those are the ones that GIN supports. Okay, so you're not gonna create a GIN index on an integer column, <laughs> probably not, okay? Gist, a little wider, um, but things like still JSON's there, text search is there. They may not be the best choice. Gin is probably a better choice for you, but Gist is still supported if you want to do it. But the ones that are primarily Gist are things like boxes, network data type, points, polygons, and ranges. Okay, those are primarily Gist. And then SP Gist, a little smaller, um, mostly related to range types or text. And I'll show you some examples of that. Okay. So let's go, let's look at some examples. B tree, standard diagram, right? You have a top node split into multiple bottom, uh, smaller nodes, which can go to longer and then finally point to the, to the B tree. Brin, here's a great example, okay? Um, I'm, I always forget how many rows there are here. Three, three, I think that's 10,000, uh, 100,000? Uh, let me see, one, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah, it's 100, 100, 100 million, 100 million entries. Um, I create a B tree on it and I create a Brin on it. And you can see that the, <laughs> the, Brin, the Brin table itself is 3.4 gigabytes. The, uh, in, the B tree index is 2.1 gigabytes. That's a lot. That's, what is that, like 40% of the main table? Brin index, 100K. Right, this is why, this is the power right here. This is the slide. If you're wondering why you'd ever use Brin, this is it. Right, that can fit in memory, no problem. Even you have a lot of columns. 
Gin, here's an example with full text, with, um, with full text search. I have two text strings. The fox is sick. How sick is this? Okay. Notice that the, the actual way we store it in full text search is to break it up into words. We'll tokenize it, okay, or lexems we call them. Um, and effectively the index, notice that the word is and the word sick is in both strings. So while fox, this, how, and the only have one match, is and sick have two. And this is the way the index looks. We only store is once, we only store sick once. And there are two pointers that go with those two entries. Obviously, it's a very simplified example. But if we were using B tree, we'd still have to have is for every match. For gin, we don't. Okay. Uh, here's a JSON example. Same issue. Name Bill, active true. Name Jack, active true. We tokenize it this way. And you'll notice that active name and true have two matches. Bill and Jack have one. Okay. This is the beauty of the, of the gin index. Yes, sir. With um, uh, de deduplication in Postgres, I mean, it seems like you're saying B tree. Is it somehow related? So, um, so in Postgres 13, or is it 14? I can't. I think it was. What was it? 13. 13. Right. Uh, Peter Gagan, who's at this conference, um, does amazing work, uh, and he worked with um, uh, Anastasia. Uh, her last name is, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember. It's, it begins with an L. Uh, Anastasia, I've met her, I, I just can't remember her last name. Um, they work together to create, allow B tree indexes to, rem, to not store the key multiple times if there's duplicates in there. Okay? And you're absolutely right that it minimizes the need for, it minimizes the need for gin if you have a lot of duplicates and you have linear data. Okay, but the issue, the issue with, with GIN, aside from the way we have the duplicates, is we're allowing a single field to be tokenized and all those tokens fed up into the index. That really can't be done with B-Tree. You know what I'm saying? Like if I have duplicate strings in B-Tree and I'm only just looking at the string matches, absolutely. The deep duplication of B-Tree was my number one feature for Postgres 13 as being amazing. But that doesn't help me here because I have multiple keyword, I have multiple token matches inside a single field. And you can't create a B-tree index on that because it's just, it would just become like a mess. Okay, so that's a great question. Yes, other questions? Okay. Um, here, there's another option we have called JSON B path, which effectively allows me to, if I'm looking at the whole path of the JSON, not the, not the individual tokens, but the whole path, I can actually hash the whole string, the whole token string, and then I can look up duplicate, I can find exact matches. I can't look up key values separately, but it's another way of doing lookups with JSON and, uh, and GIN. Um, GIST, again, very good for multi-dimensional data types like GIS, range types, IP networks. Um, this is, for example, this is what linear looks like, right? We've all seen this in, what, third grade? You know, you got a number line, right? And you, you have the numbers two or the numbers greater than four or whatever. This is great, right? But not all data comes at us like this. Uh, if the data comes at us like this, how do we do it? Well, we could kind of say greater than two, but then we've lost our whole Y dimension, right? Uh, that's a lot of red, right? So it's not, you can kind of get by, but it's not really a great solution, okay? What happens with, um, with GIST, as a member, I said GIST is a container. It contains what are called bounding boxes. And effectively, it creates boxes and then smaller boxes and smaller boxes. Oleg Bartunov, key person here in working on GIST index, if you're curious, please talk to him. Tall Russian guy, white hair, very easy to talk to. Would love to talk to you, I'm sure. But the cool part about our tree, as implemented in GIST, is you, if you're looking for a point, you find the point and then you find the box that contains points with their, near that. And then you only have to look in that box. You don't have to look in all the boxes because you just found the box that has the one. So it's kind of like, to me, that little diagram, it kind of, 
It's a big box and then a little box and a little box all the way down and you're trying to find the box and once you find the box, you just look at all the points in there and you find out which one's the closest. Can it do three-dimensional stuff? Uh, can it do three-dimensional stuff? Um, I do not believe it currently can. Uh, but I, if you could ask Oleg and let me know and then, I, then the next person asks me, I'll know the answer. Uh, but I've not seen three-dimensional in, in action. Great question though. Please, I'll ask him if you don't. If you don't ask him, I'm going to ask him. All right. Um, so again, just for two-dimensional uh, points, boxes, circles, points, polygons. If you're using GIS, GIS creates its own, effectively, you know, can, it, its own data types and creates its own gin in, GIST indexes to index all the GS. So there would be no post GIS without GIST. Without extendability, we couldn't we couldn't do this because they basically take Postgres, they load a bunch of new data types in, they load a bunch of new indexing types in, well, all of a sudden you have a GIS database. Crazy, but it works, right? Um, range indexing. Um, uh, I don't think Joe Conway's here, but if you talk to Jonathan Katz, he'd love to tell you about range indexes. Uh, they're basically start and stop inside a single field makes it very easy, because I've done queries where I've start and stop in separate fields, and it's really hard to kind of use an index effectively. By putting them in the same field, we can create GIST indexes, which basically do the similar type of box, except the boxes are big ranges and then smaller ranges and smaller ranges you can find things in, that, that fit a particular requirement. Really, really cool. I mentioned SPGIST, and this is the best diagram I can think of it. We basically take a string, like a URL, we break it up into keywords. And like HTTP is part of it, and then the domain, and then the part after it, and you can kind of create, instead of indexing the whole key, you, you splice it up, and then you index parts of that. Really cool, again, Oleg would be your person to talk to about this. Uh, we have quad point and other one, uh, KD point, I'll let, I'll let Oleg cover those. Uh, the documentation is pretty clear on those. Um, a lot of our extensions have support for this. So for example, um, we, have a, we have a B tree written for gin. I used to tell people if they had a, a lot of duplicates in B tree, they, before Postgres 13, I would say, try B tree gin, because it had, it's B tree, but it removed the duplicates. Now we have it in V tree, but we didn't back then, right? Um, cube, in array, trigram I mentioned, PostGIS, all of these have this indexing support. So, index usage summary, what did we learn? Um, when do we create indexes? This is a question I always kind of get. Um, some, some basic pointers, look at PGStat user tables. If you have a lot of sequential scans, you may want to, um, you know, you may want to put an index there. Um, PGStat statements will tell you what queries may benefit from it. Sequential scans are not always bad, but just keep in mind when they might be bad. Um, if a PGStat user index, is, is index scan is low, you might have an unnecessary index. You might want to remove that um, because unnecessary indexes do slow down the database. So when evaluating index types, look at how long it takes to build, look at how big the storage size is, look at what the insert update overhead is, look at the access speed, and then figure out what operators and what data types it supports. And this is sort of the way I kind of look at it. When I'm, because in most systems, you just have B tree, so you don't have a choice, right? You don't, <laughs> you don't have all these options. Now you do, it does allow a lot of flexibility, but at the same time, um, you, you have to sort of figure out which one to use, and that's your problem. So, uh, I am out of time. We did have some really good questions. Uh, unless somebody has a final question, we're gonna, we're gonna finish right now. All right, well, thanks very much, appreciate it.